Okay, so let me review where we got to at the end of the last lecture, which was not too long ago, so hopefully you have some recollection. So we started with this notion that um, in ADS-CFT, when you have a thermal state in the field theory, that it's dual to a black hole. And then we were uh, trying to be a little bit more precise. We said, is that thermal state, is it dual to uh, just the region outside the horizon of a black hole? Um, does it include, does it have information about what's behind the horizon? Is it dual to the entire maximally extended black hole space time? Uh, and so we had this proposal by Maldacena which said that if you think about that entire maximally extended space-time, so this is, in, in a sense, the most complete version of this black hole space-time, the Schwarzschild black hole space-time, um, he said that this thing, uh, he proposed that this thing, uh, which has two separate asymptotically ADS regions, should be dual to this natural state of two CFTs that purifies the thermal state. So it's, he says that this is dual to the thermal field double. So this state, if you compute the density matrix uh, uh, for either CFT, it's thermal. And that corresponds to the fact that this black hole spacetime has two equivalent uh, regions that look like the outside of a black hole. But then it completes that spacetime into one nice uh, complete spacetime. And this one is a pure state of the whole theory. Uh, and I emphasize that this is surprising in the sense that you're starting with two completely unrelated CFTs. They don't have any interactions between them. Um, they are really two independent physical systems. And the only connection between these two is that we're putting the state into an entangled state. It's a superposition of these tensor product states. And if I think about the individual tensor product states. If I wrote down this state, then I would say there's two theories, and each theory is in the same state, but there's just absolutely no relation at all. So if I had this two CFTs in this state, um, I would just have to say that that is dual to two completely separate spacetimes, just a, two disconnected spacetimes. Somehow what we're saying is that by taking a quantum superposition of these disconnected spacetimes, then magically, according to the, the proposal, um, this amounts to actually thinking about a new spacetime which is geometrically connected. Okay, so this is suggesting that maybe the entanglement is responsible for this um, connectedness of, uh, of the spacetime. Um, and then I also mentioned that from this point of view, the thermal entropy of that original thermal state of the CFT, now that we've written this purification, the thermal entropy can be interpreted as an entanglement entropy or a subsystem entropy. It's the entropy of either the first CFT or the second CFT or the entanglement entropy between the two. And so now from this, from this picture, we have um, another way to think about the connection between entropy and area. So we have the entanglement entropy between these two CFTs. And that's equal to the area of the horizon. But now in this maximally extended picture, the horizon, if I look at a spatial slice, so this is supposed to be a spatial slice at some t equals 0, that looks like two hyperbolic spaces uh, connected by some wormhole. And then this horizon area is just uh, a surface which is dividing that space into two parts, each part having one of the asymptotic regions. And it turns out that this surface is, um, I mean, there would be many such surfaces. OK. Um, but this surface turns out to be the one that extremizes the area functional. Um, so it's, it's uh, 
it's a special surface dividing the space into these two parts. Yeah, absolutely, right. So this is, a, this is a, an interesting point. One of the things that we have, if, so this is the causal diagram um, for this space-time. What it shows is that if, I, if I'm an observer outside of the black hole, I could fall into the black hole horizon, okay, but I can never come out of the other side. Okay, so I can only end up at the singularity. From this side, I can fall in but I can't get out to the other asymptotic region. So there's no, way for, um, there's no way for me to directly influence what happens on the other side. Um, and I think that's quite similar to, um, to the fact that you've got the two CFTs um, and they're not interacting. I can't, I can't um, change one and, and directly interact with the other. Um, what I can do is to have, you know, I could, I could send something into the black hole and that could affect the future of someone falling into this side of the black hole. Um, and that's roughly like how when you have an entangled state, you could, do, you could alter one side. You could make a measurement on one part of the system. And then that could affect a later measurement on the other part of the system. Okay, so it's a very beautiful connection between something which is entirely geometrical and something which is entirely quantum mechanical. Okay. All right, um, so I wanted to return to one of the questions that was asked in the first, um, in the first part. Um, we wrote down this as one particular purification of the thermal state. It's a special purification which is very symmetrical on the two sides. Um, but I could, do, I could think of many other purifications, um, either in the same system of two CFTs or I could have one CFT and some other, CFT, some other system, it could be a larger, a, a different CFT or, or even some more general quantum system. Um, but I'm going to stick with this one CFT, or this, this two equivalent CFTs, um, and I'll tell you um, what a different purification might look like. Okay, so it turns out that starting from this pur the, starting from this purification, you can show that the most general purification in this 2CFT system would be one where I take that thermofield double state and I act with some unitary, some operator which is a tensor product of a unitary operator and the identity. And so if I do this, then you can, s you find that the density matrix for the first copy of the CFT is changed, but the density matrix for the second copy is the same. Okay, so it's still, um, okay, so if I think of the, the thermal density matrix, um, this state would be a purification of that, which is not symmetrical. So the, the one side is still the thermal density matrix, the other side is now some other density matrix. Um, and so the question would be, so the question could be, well, what would that be dual to? Um, how could we understand that on the gravity side? So a simple way to think about it is to take this U to be um, some local operator. some local operator in, um, in the CFT1, okay, or, or a slightly smeared local operator if we want to make everything really um, well-defined. Okay, so what does that do? So I, t I, take this, I take this state of the two CFTs, and now I just act with a local operator in one of them. Um, so in field theory, that does something like creating a, for example, creating a particle. It creates some excitation, a local excitation in one of the, in one of the field theories. And in the gravity picture, okay, uh, what does, what does acting with some local operator do? Um, so that local excitation in the field theory corresponds to something where, um, say I act with the operator at this t equals zero, um, that might 
that would correspond to something uh, where I perturb the gravity solution out close to the boundary. Okay, so an ADS CFT doing things locally or, or changing the UV physics um, corresponds to changes which are out near the boundary. Um, so, I, so I perturb the CFT corresponds to a local perturbation near the boundary in the gravity system, but then that propagates inward, um, or actually, generally speaking, that will have effects um, going forward and going backwards. Um, so that simple kind of modification where I start with that purification and I change it to a different one, um, you see it might correspond to a different geometry, which is mostly the same as the first geometry, but now there's a little bit of, uh, maybe there's a few gravity waves um, propagating in and bouncing off there and, and propagating back through the horizon. Okay, so a different purif purification um, might in this case correspond to a slightly different geometry. Um, if I acted with a local operator down here, uh, that could change, you know, that could change the space time in this region. If I acted over here, it could change it in this region. So generally, if I think about acting with uh, U, maybe U is a combination, maybe it's a, a collection of local things. Um, so these would make changes, um, and you notice that in general, I could change any place in the geometry um, except the region here, except the region outside that horizon on this side. I can't, by, by what we just said, I can't perturb the boundary on this side and change anything outside here. Okay, um, okay so we can change geometry everywhere outside. I'll call this wedge two. So let's say this is wedge one, and I could say this would be one, two. Okay. So what does this suggest? Um, so we have these different purifications. They have different density matrix for CFT1, but the same density matrix for CFT2. What we see on the gravity side is that you've got space times which are generally the same as that space time in this region here, wedge number two, but different everywhere else. Okay. And so what this suggests is that the density matrix row two that we started with, the thermal density matrix, um, if we want to say, what is that really dual to? Um, it's kind of dual, it's, it's dual to the part outside the horizon. So it suggests that uh, rho thermal is dual to just the outside horizon region. And then different purifications would be different space times with that same exterior, but some different geometry past the horizon. So it's not, there's not a unique way to extend this geometry. Um, we just usually talk about the symmetrical way. Yes? Yes? Yeah, so it's, it's just that if I, right, if I consider, um, a field theory state, say I, say I have the vacuum of the field theory, and let's say I'm talking about a scalar field, and I, I act with this operator, psi, it's a local operator at time zero, and position zero. Okay. Um, so roughly speaking, I mean this state, compared to the vacuum, it now has, um, is it, roughly speaking, I've created a particle at this place, okay. But then, if, if I think of the state as a whole, um, I mean, this particle didn't just appear. Uh, in, in this state, there's a history, and so it must have, it must have come in uh, 
from some past. Maybe it, it spread out, and it, like for some reason, because of the way I've constructed it, it's localized at that particular time. But then in the future, in the past, it would be, it would be delocalized. And so, uh, so it's only kind of at the one time when, it, when it's localized. Okay. And, and it, it, there's changes in the past and changes in the future. And then on the gravity side, that, that would be indicated by this. <clears throat> yes? I'm sorry, what did you do on what side? Ah, OK, good. So, yeah, so, so right, I mean, if I, if I have this and I measure the energy at once, I mean, this, this, I'd, have to, I'd have to have this whole CFT set up in my lab somehow. Um, but yeah, if you were able, if you were some kind of uh, uh, experimenter that had control over this and you could measure the energy of the one side precisely, then you could put it into a, you could put the whole state projected into this. And you know, presumably this would, I argued already that that would correspond to just two disconnected space times. So that would just destroy the entire um, connection between the two halves. OK. Um, yeah. So far, I'm just talking about, um, so far, I, I, I'm just imagining pure ADS, where, um, so, so if I have the, or it's not, sorry, not pure ADS, but um, um, j just the, like this, this geometry and, and maybe small perturbations of it. So, I, I, so far, I'm just considering a case where, uh, where it would be unambiguous. And later, we'll talk about um, how, to, how to understand what to say um, in more general space times. Okay. Um, just one other point. Um, so, so rho thermal suggests it's dual to the, the outside the horizon region. Um, another piece of evidence for that is that if I know the density matrix for the one CFT, um, then of course I can, I can calculate lots of observables like correlation functions as long as they're localized to one side. And using these kinds of correlation functions, I could, for example, probe anywhere in this region by, say, calculating a response function. If I calculate something like this, O of x1, uh, O of x2, uh, correlation functions like this in the CFT, where maybe, maybe this one is in the future of this one, um, then you can think of that on the gravity side as, as sending in making a perturbation here and then measuring how it affects the state here. Okay. Um, these kinds of observables would be sensitive to any small local change within this wedge. Okay, so let's say I, suppose I put uh, a little mirror. So, so I, have, I have the unperturbed black hole state. But now I change it by putting a, a little object in here. It could be a mirror or another object. Okay. Um, well, then I could, I could detect that object. So from the gravity point of view, I could detect that object by sending in a signal and measuring, so making a perturbation here and measuring what comes out here. Okay, so I could, if, it, could be a light, it could be a laser beam. I could, if I sent in a laser beam here, I would, I would find the laser beam out here. Okay. And that's the kind of thing, in the CFT point of view, that's the kind of thing I would, um, I would be sensitive to if, if I calculated one of these response functions. So I make a perturbation in one place, calculate the effect in another place. So with these kind of simple observables that I, where, I, where, I, um, where I could calculate them directly from rho thermal, or from, from rho on, on the right-hand side, uh, you could see that I can probe basically anywhere in that wedge um, any place in this wedge is, uh, is kind of accessible by these, by these observations, which map over to um, response functions. Okay. So you can actually see more or less directly um, how you could go about um, figuring out the geometry in that region um, using this density matrix. Okay, so I just calculate all these correlation functions, and, and that will tell me about that region. But they don't tell me about the other regions uh, and then we have this other argument that 
they can't really tell, this, this density matrix can't really tell me about the other regions because there are lots of purifications and the other regions are different in, in different purifications. Okay, any, any more questions about that? Okay, so for this black hole space time, then we have that the thermal field double seems to correspond to the whole thing according to Baldacena. And the density matrix for the left half seems to correspond to this wedge. The density matrix for the right half seems to correspond to this wedge. And apparently, so, so if I know this density matrix and I know this density matrix, um, that actually doesn't tell me the whole state. That's, that's just a limited amount of information. Um, what's left is the details of how the two sides are entangled with each other. Okay, so if I want to ask how is the information about these regions three and four behind the horizon, how is that information contained in here? It seems that it should be contained in the entanglement information um, about how the first CFT is entangled with the second CFT. And four. Details. Okay. So that's interesting uh, in the sense that the, the physics of this region, I mean, the, the, say the local uh, fields in this region, um, I mean, According to this, they don't really correspond to knowing what those are doing. It's not about some additional degrees of freedom in the field theory. Um, we've already got, if we wanted to de describe regions one and region two, you've already got the two CFTs. And region three is really just about understanding that is about understanding how those are entangled with each other. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I think if I, if I chose a relatively smooth operation here, then, then I could expect a smooth solution here. Uh, if I did something more singular, uh, it could be singular. So Schenker and Stanford have talked about these shockwave solutions recently that um, are, are uh, basically like this. If, if, I do something, if I do something sharply localized on the boundary, um, then, then I, I can ex expect some shockwave type solution, um, and Stanford and Schenker discuss these things, so, so those, are, those are not um, completely smooth, but then I can imagine smoothing it out by smoothing out the operator that I act with. Oh, I'm not sure if I want to do that. Let's <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I would, I would think that. Yeah. Okay. So here's okay. Let, just as as a diversion. Uh, you're, you know, I think, I think the question could be, if I consider, this is sort of an open question, but if I consider um, a more or less generic state of these two CFTs, okay, so, so of that combined system, um, okay, 
So I have, I have the two CFTs. Choose some very generic, uh, say, high energy state. Maybe I fix the energy, and I choose a generic state of the, the two CFTs. What is that dual to? Um, and what you would realize is that the density matrix for each of these two sides is very close. Uh, in, in, in general, uh, in a generic state, it's, it's very close to being uh, thermal. Okay. Um, and so you would, you would conclude that whatever geometry is dual to this kind of generic state, I think, would have two Schwarzschild black hole exteriors. Um, but then it's, a, it's kind of an open question, what, what is on the inside? And, and I think, um, right, I think that literature starting from Stanford and Schenker and then later Susskind and others, um, I'm not sure what the current status is. I mean, I think they're suggesting that maybe, maybe these generic states are dual to something with a long and complicated wormhole. But I don't know if there's evidence whether it should be purely geometrical or not. I mean, I would have guessed that maybe it's not geometrical. And OK. Um, let me, so let me just mention one thing, which is, again, a little bit of an aside, but it connects with um, some things that people talked a lot about in recent years. Um, so, so there's a, an interesting consequence of this observation that you know, we're saying the thermal state, in a sense, it's dual to the black hole exterior. Okay. So remember, this thermal density matrix is just an ensemble of high energy. It's an ensemble of states of the CFT. And, and generally, um, if I took a typical state, OK, if I took a typical state from that ensemble, this is what we would call a black hole microstate. So this is a typical state in this ensemble is a pure state of one CFT. Um, and this is one of the things that the entropy is counting. Okay. So the question is, well, what does that correspond to? Um, this is actually closely related to Atisha's last question. Um, what does that correspond to? If the thermal field double is dual to this, and the density matrix is dual to this, um, what, is, what, is the micro, what are the microstates dual to? Um, and I mean, naively, because, because this one is some ensemble of all these microstates, um, so it's confusing because you, you might think that the microstate is dual to a black hole with some smooth geometry behind the horizon. Um, so you might think, yeah, here's my, here's my microstate, here's the black hole horizon, and, uh, and then there's some geometry behind that. I'm not exactly sure, but, but at least up until a few years ago, people were largely convinced that if you fell into a black hole, there would be smooth geometry. and, and they probably would have said that it doesn't really matter which microstate you're looking at, that geometry should be similar. Okay. So, so if that's true, if all of these microstates have some smooth geometry behind the horizon, um, then you would probably conclude that the ensemble of microstates also has that same smooth geometry behind the horizon. Okay. But we've argued that that can't be the right interpretation for this ensemble because different purifications of this have different geometries behind the horizon. So one way out of this, there's two ways out of this. One way out of this is to say uh, these microstates actually have no geometry behind the horizon. This is the firewall answer. You could say all of these microstates are, you get to the horizon and that's it. And then it would be kind of consistent to say that the ensemble of all of those is this region uh, outside the horizon. Uh, the other way around this is what's known as state dependence. And that is to say that, OK, so, so, so if I wanted to argue precisely that the ensemble would have some smooth, that the ensemble would have some smooth geometry behind the horizon, um, given that all the microstates do, I might try to find an operator where if I take the expectation value of that operator in the microstate, uh, this, would, this would be how I would tell that the geometry behind the horizon is smooth. Okay. 
So supposing that I could find some operator like that that would be answering the question, is the geometry behind the horizon smooth? And suppose that there exists such an operator which is state independent, which, where I could use the same operator for all of the different states. This is normally how it works in quantum mechanics. If I want to ask the same question, I use the same operator. Well, if there's such a state independent operator, which has the same answer for all the microstates, it's going to have the same answer for this density matrix, and it would tell me that the geometry behind the horizon you know, exists and is smooth, and, um, and that, that's sort of a contradiction because we already know that there are purifications of this where you don't have a smooth geometry behind the horizon. So the, the way around it is to suggest that if I want to learn that if there is a geometry behind the horizon of black hole microstates and I want to learn about it, um, I need to conjecture that the operator I need to use for the different microstates is different. And then I can't give this averaging argument. I can't use the argument for the ensemble. So, so this connects with, you know, there's a, a big recent discussion of whether black holes, if you take into account quantum mechanics, whether they have firewalls at the horizon. And to me, it seemed that the output of that discussion, um, or one of the outputs was that, uh, that, that many people agree on, was that you either have firewalls or you have state dependence. Um, and this is, I think, a simple way to, to argue for that. OK. OK, so we've talked a lot about black holes and how, how this uh, decomposition into density matrix for the one CFT and the other CFT works and what, what the different density matrices are dual to and how the black hole entropy can be interpreted as a subsystem entropy. Um, what we're working towards is the, a, a generalization of this um, where instead of this kind of artificial system of two CFTs, I just consider, say, a single CFT, and then I look at a region of that CFT and its complementary region. So what we're going to get to is, is the claim that many of the things that I just said for this black hole, the two-sided black holes, are also true if I just think of a single CFT and I kind of arbitrarily divide it up into two subsets. And so on the way there, it's interesting to uh, recall a fact about, okay, so we're just going to now consider the case of just a single field theory. And I want to recall a fact about uh, actually arbitrary quantum field theories, local quantum field theories. Um, so I'm going to start on Minkowski space. And I want to remind you that actually this thermofield double state uh, makes an appearance, even if I'm just considering a, a single quantum field theory, and even if I'm just considering the vacuum state of a single quantum field theory. OK. So, okay, so this doesn't have to be a holographic field theory or a conformal field theory. This is, this is general so far. Um, as a result from the 1970s as well. OK, so, so we have our field theory in Minkowski space. And what I want to do is consider a half space. So for example, x greater than 0. And so I, I want to ask, uh, what is the density matrix for a half space. OK, now I have to be careful. What do I mean by the density matrix for half of a quantum field theory? OK, so local quantum field theory, it has degrees of freedom over here, and it has degrees of freedom over here. Um, if I imagine regulate, regulating this by some, some lattice, for example, then I would have specific degrees of freedom on one side and, and degrees of freedom on the other side. Um, and I could say, I could, I could then definitely say, OK, what is the quantum state of this subsystem? 
at least in the regularized theory, it's clear that I could talk about the subsystem and I could talk about the density matrix um, um, and then maybe take, take some limit. Okay. So I want to ask the question, what is the, what is the density matrix for the half space? Um, and the answer, and I won't have time to uh, review the derivation of this, but I'd be happy to do that outside of the regular lectures. Um, so the answer you may have heard of is that um, it's a thermal state. But not with, the regu with respect to the regular Hamiltonian. Um, with respect to what's called the Rindler Hamiltonian. Um, it's respect to, with respect to a Hamiltonian which generates Basically, it's actually, it's actually, it generates boosts in the original. It's one of the boost generators. Um, it generates a flow in this right-hand wedge. Um, which people would call Rindler time. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I mean. Um, so you can consider this vector field So that's the, that's the time-like unit vector and the vector field in the x direction is x and t. So this is, this is some particular vector field which I'm considering just in this right-hand, um, actually this right-hand wedge. Okay, so if I, if I follow the flow of this vector field, it looks like this. And, and this is a symmetry of Minkowski space, it's the, it's the boost symmetry. And so I can use the Noether procedure to associate a conserved quantity to that symmetry. And that conserved quantity is, I'll call it H eta. I'll call it eta the time, eta is like the time coordinate that is moving along those, that flow. H eta is the generator of that. which I said was the boost generator. Okay. And so the density matrix, it turns out, is just the thermal state. If I, if I wrote down the thermal state with respect to that Hamiltonian, uh, which, which I could do by Okay, so this would be the usual way, e to the minus h, that that's the thermal density matrix for that Hamiltonian. Um, the claim is that is the density matrix for the half space. Um, and there's a, there's a simple path integral derivation of that. Um, I can either give you references for that or explain it. Um, but for now, we'll just take that as, uh, as, as a true calculation. Okay. Um, this is related to the statement that an accelerated observer will see a thermal bath of particles. Okay, because this is, this is the time, if, I, if I'm an accelerated observer, I would move along one of these trajectories. And so it's like my time, as an ex, my time coordinate as an accelerated observer. And the statement that the, the density matrix is thermal is related to the statement that I'll, I will experience uh, thermal physics as one of these accelerated observers. Okay, okay so, that's, and th so this is just a statement about the vacuum of a, of a quantum field theory. And we have a similar statement about the, the other half. Okay, so it's symmetrical. Okay, so similarly, row left is equal to there's there's some other time. And if I want to think of the entire state, the entire Minkowski space vacuum, okay, so we, we now have a state where there are two equivalent sides, and each half is described by a density matrix, which is thermal. And so you might guess that the full state, if I wanted to, uh, I could represent it as a thermal field double state. Okay, and that turns out to be true.
So even if I'm thinking about a, a single quantum field theory, and I'm thinking about the vacuum state, and I just arbitrarily divide the space into two halves, um, then this state has a description as some entangled state between the two halves. There's, a, there's entanglement even in the vacuum state, um, and it takes exactly the form of the thermal field double state that we looked at before. If you look at a free field theory, you can, you can be even more specific. You can define a set of field theory modes in this wedge and a set of corresponding field theory modes in this wedge. And then the, basically each, each mode in this wedge is entangled with the corresponding mode on the other side. Okay, so, so the vacuum state of a, a field theory um, has this characteristic entanglement, which has the structure of the thermofield double state. Okay. Incidentally, if I remove that entanglement, if I, try to, if I try to consider a state where this side is not entangled with this side, what happens is that the stress energy tensor becomes singular all along this region. Okay, so states. So this is entangled and states with no entanglement. For example, taking a typical state on either side, you get a singular. Yes. Sorry. Uh, I'm I'm not sure. So I guess they depend on on your definition. The argument I know is for a local quantum field theory. Yeah. Yeah. Why does it become singular? I, I mean, it's like. Um, So I've, I've changed the state somehow. Um, in the free field case, what I can do is simply, um, so, so there, I define, I, I have the usual modes of my fields uh, on all of Minkowski space. And, um, and then I define these other modes on the left and right. And, and I, just, I just calculate, I can, I can calculate that the usual Minkowski space vacuum, um, in terms of these left and right modes, it is a state that looks like this. Um, I can then calculate what happens. Uh, I could basically start with a state instead like this, which, which is not entangled between the two sides. Um, if I try to translate that back to, um, to um, something involving the modes of the whole theory, um, I, I guess I just find that the I mean, I just calculate the stress energy tensor, and I find that it has a singularity there. So I'm not sure. I mean, I think it's basically that um, by, by disentangling them at that one point, um, y you've, you've made a, a large modification to the, like the UV physics. So somehow, if, if you want uh, a non-singular stress tensor, um, then the, the, the UV physics uh, should, should be the same as the vacuum state, basically. Um, if, if I zoom in to, to just very small distances, um, then everything should, including the entanglement between local degrees of freedom, should look like the vacuum state. But if I completely disentangle it, then even if I zoom in uh, you know, a very large amount, then I can still detect differences uh, compared with the vacuum state. And so it corresponds to a, a very singular kind of modification of my field theory state. Um, okay, great. So that's, that's a statement about any field theory. Now what I want to do is go back to CFT. Okay. Um, I want to think about I want to think about the CFT on a sphere. Okay, but now not in the thermal state, just in the vacuum state. OK, so this is dual to what's called pure global ADS spacetime. Okay, this is a spacetime where, where the time slices 
our hyperbolic space, negatively curved space. Um, it's some warped product of hyperbolic space and, and time. Um, and what I want to do is think about a similar question. Okay, so instead of dividing the plane up into two regions, I want to divide the ball up, the sphere, up into two regions. The B bar. Okay, so CFT, again, in the vacuum state on a sphere. And I want to ask, well, what is the density matrix for this half, and what is the density matrix for this half, and you know, how can I write the full state as some entangled state? Okay. So the good news is that I can map this. There's some conformal transformation that maps this problem to this problem. So precisely, um, Okay, in, in order to be able to draw this, okay, so, so, so this ball is, that's, that's like the boundary, okay, so that's, that's the geometry, it's the boundary geometry at some particular time. This is the geometry my, my CFT is living on. Okay. So that split into two halves corresponds to like this half of the ball and this half of the ball. B bar. Okay, so let's let's draw. In order to be able to draw this, I'm I'm going to flatten it out a little bit um, because I want to draw time as well. Okay. Um, so the statement is that this there's a there's a conformal transformation of the metric of this of Minkowski space um, that maps this Rindler wedge into what we call the causal diamond associated with that ball. Okay, so, so think about all of the points P where every causal curve through P passes through B. So it defines a diamond. Um, on this diagram here, okay, so this is the ball. The diamond that I'm talking about, it's, it's, a di it's something on the boundary going into the past and future from that ball. Okay, and so the claim is that by, by making a conformal transformation from this picture, um, I can map this Rindler wedge to this diamond-shaped region associated with this ball. And this region here maps to a diamond-shaped region associated with the complementary ball. Um, so it's, it's important to understand this picture. So if you, if you have questions, uh, it's a good idea to ask them. Okay. So, we, so we've, got, we've got the sphere. The inside of this cylinder we're not worried about yet. That's, that would be the inside of ADS, but I'm still thinking about the field theory. So I'm thinking about the sphere. I've just drawn an S1, but in general it's an SD. And then there's time. And then I've drawn a... A ball on this, I've divided the sphere into two parts. Okay, so that's like on this S1, I've divided it into this part and this part. And then for each part, I've considered the causal diamond on the boundary. And, and so the claim is by some informal transformation, okay, so, so now the CFT on Minkowski space can be related by this symmetry to a CFT on a part of the sphere times time. OK. And, and the two Rindler wedges of Minkowski space map into these two wedges over here. So the bottom line is, by knowing what the density matrix is in this simple case, and, and I know this for all quantum field theories, and then I'm going to apply a conformal transformation 
then I, I'm going to know immediately what the density matrix is for this half of the ball and for this part of the ball. And I also know, I can also, I can also say that the full state of my CFT on the ball is like a thermofield double state on the, between the left half and the right half of the ball. Okay. So let, let me write down that conclusion. So, so the vacuum state on the ball is equal to, what we learn is that it's equal to something that looks just like the thermofield double state or I'll say it, B, B bar where these energies are, so, so that Rindler Hamiltonian, it maps into some, there's a, there's a symmetry generator that lives inside this ball. There's a conformal killing vector that lives inside the ball, so um, in this, that lives inside this particular region. Okay, so there's a particular definition of time. In this region uh, of a, for a CFT, there's a particular uh, time-like vector field that defines a, uh, a symmetry. Okay, I'll call that H zeta, to pick another Greek letter. Um, so, there's, there's, uh, so there's a particular natural Hamiltonian that defines a time inside that ball, and there's one that defines a time inside that one. And now my vacuum state of the field theory is equal to this thermal field double state with respect to those two Hamiltonians. Yes? Yeah, yeah, so the same one, okay, let, uh, okay, let's just, just be a little bit more. So, so the entirety of Minkowski space, the entirety of Minkowski space, um, it gets mapped to one particular wedge of this global ADS. Okay, so I've, the side, okay, the side view is this, okay. So the, enti the, the entirety of Minkowski space um, gets mapped into this diamond on the boundary of, of that cylinder. And then these two wedges, here, I'll use the colored chalk. Uh, get mapped into this wedge and, and some other wedge over here. Okay, so it gets mapped into two wedges. Okay, so yeah, it's one conformal transformation. Okay, so if I know the state of Minkowski space, then I just do the mapping and I get this. Okay, so what's the point of all this? We're at, we're at a good, spot now because um, what I've done is I just started with a plain old CFT in the vacuum state. Nothing to do with thermal physics or black holes or anything. And what we realized is that the formal structure of that state, the entanglement structure of that state, um, if I make some arbitrary decomposition into some ball and some other complement of that ball, then the entanglement structure looks exactly like what we had in the black hole case. It is a thermal field double state. And so we, we can kind of use the same arguments as when I was talking about the black hole. So if we ask what is row left and row right uh, dual to, and uh, um, you know, you, you can, so, so I, I made all these arguments in the black hole case, but they're exactly the same. Um, so it suggests that the, the density matrix for this ball would be dual, there's some, there's some now bulk wedge 
here and a bulk wedge there. Okay. Um, so I'm just, I'm just going to repeat all the things I said for the black hole, but now in this case. Um, so left, the ultra region one, row right, the ultra region two, and uh, it suggests regions three and four. Okay. So one, two, three, four um, are related to how the exactly how the two sides are entangled. We can even ask about the, what about the, what about the actual entanglement entropy between the two sides? Um, does the entanglement entropy between that ball and the other ball match with the area of with the area of the surface. Okay, so that was, that was the, in some sense, the starting point in the black hole thing that we had the connection between thermal entropy and area. We later understood that as the, a measure of the entanglement between the two CFTs in the thermal field double. Now we've shown that just in a regular single CFT, you can actually view it as a thermal field double. Um, we can make similar arguments that the left and right density matrices map into these two wedges that end at this particular surface in the bulk um, defined by, um, you know, which, by, by this causal construction, which, which regions can we communicate with. Um, and so if it's like the black hole case, then we would say that the entropy, the entanglement entropy between the two halves should match with the area of that surface. Okay. And the answer to that is that it, it actually does match. Um, they're both infinite, but so that's that's good. Uh, but there's a more detailed matching. Even if even if you regulate the thing, okay. So in ADS CFT, we kind of understand that if you put a UV cutoff on the field theory, this corresponds to having some IR cutoff. For example, just considering the region of ADS out to a certain distance, but then not going all the way, not going the infinite distance to the boundary, okay. Um, so for a conformal field theory for one of these ball-shaped regions, you can actually compute the entanglement entropy, and it matches exactly with the area of, of this surface that I've drawn in the bulk geometry. So that's the first statement where we've generalized the Bekenstein-Hawking um, calculation to, or the, or, sorry, the Bekenstein um, area entropy connection to a case where now we're not talking about a thermal state at all. We're just talking about, say, the vacuum state. And we're, we're talking about some subsystem in the vacuum state. And we find that the entropy of that subsystem matches with the area of some naturally associated, I mean, basically, basically what we've done is we've made this pure ADS look a bit like a black hole by making some arbitrary choices, and then we carried over the entropy area connection, and we found that it worked. Um, and so to, I guess I'll finish up. Um, So to conclude, I mean, basically, then I think this, this is a way of motivating um, what Ryu and Taki and Agi did. It's not really how they motivated it. Um, they basically now said, uh, what about more general states? And more general regions. Okay, so what, um, what if I, instead of looking at the vacuum state, uh, I consider some excited state, which is dual to some other geometry? Okay, and what if instead of considering this region of the ball, I consider some other, some other region of the ball? Okay, um, 
is there still this connection between entanglement entropy and the area of some surface in between? Okay, and their conjecture basically says yes, that, that there's, that there's this, con that, that there's this uh, connection in general, okay? So if I have a, a state psi, and whatever geometry is dual to it, and I divide up the boundary into a region A and some region A complement, um, okay? So in all the examples so far, the subsystem entropy of A was equal to the area of some surface that divided the bulk space into two parts. where one part had the boundary A and the other part had the boundary A bar. Okay. So in the general conjecture, it's the same thing. We think about, we think about the two regions. We think about some spatial slice, and we think about some surface that divides that into two parts. Okay. But then the question is, well, which, ex exactly which surface um, should we be talking about? What is the natural surface? Um, and this is, this is kind of the meat of the conjecture. Um, the Ryu and Takenagi say that the entanglement entropy is equal to the area. So remember, when, when we talked about the black hole case, there were lots of surfaces that separated into the two halves. But the horizon turned out to be the one with extremal area. It extremizes the area functional. Um, and this is the, this is the conjecture in general, that it's the area of A tilde, which is the, which extremizes, so it divides uh, space into two halves where, uh, I don't know, A, A prime with boundary A and a bar prime with boundary A bar, and it extremizes the area functional. And this is actually the covariant version of the conjecture um, by Hubini and Rangamani and Takenagi. Ryu and Takenagi originally just considered Spatial, uh, spatial surfaces, um, and this, this is covariant, so it's supposed to apply. Okay, so next time, so it's kind of a motivation of how to go from black hole entropy area connections to entropy area connections in general. This is the Ryutaki and Eigen conjecture, and the, the last two lectures I'm gonna talk about first a little bit of evidence for that, more evidence for that, and then um, consequences. There are lots of amazing consequences of that. And, so that's all for today.